holistic health of families and the city of Wichita at large. We'd just love to thank the council for approving this proclamation. Thank you to all of the Wichita Coalition uh, members for being here today. And we encourage all of you this month to, if there's a little one in your life, to please read to them, encourage handing them books, and uh, um, enjoy the reading with process with them. So thank you very much. Madam Clerk. Kansas Aviation Museum Day. You're here to receive the proclamation for Kansas Aviation Museum Day. Please make your way to the front. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas, National Aviation History Month is recognized throughout the month of November to honor the rich heritage of aviation. And whereas, Wichita and Kansas have played a vital role in the growth and success of aviation advancement over the past century and a half. And whereas, the Kansas Aviation Museum was established in 1991 to preserve, inspire, educate, and commemorate Kansas aviation for the future and has dedicated over three decades of preserving and showcasing the history through the museum to our community, region, and worldwide. And whereas, the city of Wichita recognizes and values the important piece of our city's heritage that is displayed through the museum. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, mayor of the city of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of November 12th, 2022, as Kansas Aviation Museum Day in the city of Wichita and encourage all citizens to continue the work of promoting the rich aviation and aerospace history produced by the citizens and companies of our great city. On behalf of the board and our employees and staff, I want to say thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to the city council uh, for your support of the Kansas Aviation Museum. It's a beautiful Art Deco building that sits off the main road of George Washington Boulevard that was actually built by the city in the 1920s to get people directly from the city to the airport. So we encourage you to come visit us and we'd love to show off what we have here that shows the history of Wichita Aviation. So again, thank you very much. We appreciate it and look forward to seeing you out. Madam Clerk. Awards, Certificate of Recognition. That, you here? Mr. Pat McKernan. So we have a certificate of appreciation uh, to, in recognition of Pat McKernan's uh, work here at the city. So the certificate reads, in recognition of 40 years of public service as an employee of the city of Wichita, Pat McKernan is the landscape supervisor and lead gardener at Botanica, the Wichita Gardens. Pat has been a gardener for the city of Wichita since before Botanica opened to the public in 1987. He played an integral role in opening the gardens and has led efforts uh, in environmental stewardship through horticulture ever since the gardens opened. So congratulations on four decades of service. And also
also, Pat, we have a uh, certificate of appreciation for the League of Kansas Municipalities. So the League of Kansas Municipalities bestows this certificate of appreciation upon Pac uh, McKernan in recognition of their 40-year contribution to the betterment of Kansas communities through loyal and dedicated services to the city of Wichita. Hi, good morning. I'm Lindsay Panaka, and I'm the very interim director at Botanica in addition to my role as arts and culture director for the city of Wichita. I've been assigned at Botanica about two months, which is nothing compared to Pat's service uh, to the city. Uh, just to reiterate, 40 years of employment with the city of Wichita, 35 years of that at Botanica since the day it opened, which is pretty incredible service. So we're really thankful for Pat's service and commitment to the gardens and and, and, and beyond, I know there's a lot of gardeners in the room. I know there's a lot of board of directors who are watching uh, on the televised version of this meeting. And we know we have 66,000 tulips going in the ground uh, at this very moment. So we definitely don't <coughs> want to miss an opportunity to recognize this outstanding achievement in employment. Pat, would you like to say a word or two? Uh, thank you all very much. It's been a great honor to build Botanica. And I do need to get my crews back to work. So thank you very much. Madam Clerk. William Stauffer, repurposing of old public library. All right, the chair recognizes William, AKA Bill Stauffer. Welcome, my friend. Your uh, time doesn't start to get here, so no rush. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, members of council, Mr. Mayor, city manager. My name is William Stauffer. South Topeka, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I'm here to briefly talk about my vision of uh, repurposing the old library known as Brutus. Uh, there is a public forum, and I've reached out to IT. Many of us are having problems logging on to that public forum. So I thought I would take this opportunity to uh, mention what I think would be a good idea. I'm not here representing City Arts. I'm not here representing my organization. This is just strictly me. What I would like to see happen to the old city library, I think would be a great place to move city arts. Here are the reasons why. In its current location, it is very limited, and I would like to see more access to parking. But the main thing is, if we move to the old library, it would give city arts more opportunities for fundraising, more classes, more opportunities for the artists, which are several months behind in presenting their work, but numero uno, I think it would be a great opportunity in such a large facility to not only hold fundraising opportunities for our arts part of our city, but also to creating something that is very uh, popular right now, which is called an immersive experience. And if you're not familiar with that, you could research Meow Wolf or Obscura in Tulsa. And this would bring a lot of uh, outside dollars to our community help the downtown area, and I think it would be quite the attraction. And uh, right now, that in these economic times, I think that's very important uh, because being an artist myself and the organization I represent, uh, we do need more opportunities to expand our arts and culture. That's all I have to say. That's my opinion. I'll stand for questions. If not, Mr. Layton, if at any time, if this is something worth consideration, I can show you some numbers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, we got two bills on the uh, public agenda today. Next up, we got Bill Stout. Morning. Morning, sir. As it says, I'm Bill Stout, District 5. You guys all know me. Uh, 
I'm here today, quite frankly, because on October the 13th, as we're all aware, the media released a uh, video footage involving the mayor, a local police officer, and our city manager. First of all, I served with the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Department in the 90s. My father was with WPD for 23 years, retired as deputy chief. My cousin, 25 years, retired as a captain. I have some knowledge about local law enforcement. And when I watched this video, I was mortified. I was absolutely disgusted by the mayor's actions, as many in the community are. But I'm far more disgusted by your continued attempts to blame the police officer for the event. So, Mr. Mayor, you can try to justify your actions. You can make excuses and accusations. You can claim it being political season. But they weren't justified. In fact, they were unethical. So I stand here today to call for your resignation. It's real simple. At the beginning of the video, the mayor placed a call to the city manager. He says, hey, Bob, hey, I'm being screamed at by one of your cops. This was an attempt to intimidate an officer. The officer was not screaming. The mayor continued, who is the chief now? I find it extremely concerning that the mayor of the largest city in the state doesn't know who's in charge of our police department. He says, I got this guy who doesn't know who I am, and he's screaming at me to turn around. Does the mayor believe that his position comes with special privilege and that he's above the rules and the law? Well, per the city ethics policy that you all voted on, that's not the case. Representative government is based upon the consent of the governed. Every citizen has the right to expect those who govern to act not for themselves, but for the governed as a whole. It also continues and says, they shall not seek favors nor use position or prestige of office for personal gain. Maybe we should read the ethics policy. At one point during the exchange, the mayor says, quote, this guy tried to kick me out of what we appropriated for neighborhood cleanups. It's based on his attitude and not facts. Well, let's talk about facts. You broke the rules. According to the city website, the cleanup was limited to persons making less than $88,000 $720.01 per year. According to Kansas Open Records, the mayor's salary is currently $113,626 before benefits. The cleanup was limited to items from a person's personal residence. Per the mayor's own words, I got a bunch of stuff from one of my rentals. The mayor decided to drive around the line of people waiting, went in the exit. When he was asked if he had the postcard for the invitation, he said, quote, I don't know if I got a mailer or not. Well, eventually, he got the special treatment he was looking for at the expense of the taxpayers. He was allowed to dump his trash while others were turned away, didn't have to follow the rules. He and the city manager were successful in their intimidation of a police officer. In fact, during the call, statements of the city manager included, Officer, this is Bob Layton. I assume the mayor is trying to get to an event. Can you let him pass? When the officer said no, the manager asked the mayor, can I have the officer's name again? Yet another attempt to intimidate a police officer, repugnant. The mayor has never formally apologized to the Wichita PD or the officer involved. He continues to blame and publicly criticize the police officer. The FOP has requested a formal apology. The state has requested a resignation. And the mayor continues to make accusations and passive-aggressive comments towards citizens who don't share his beliefs via email and social media. He has even gone so far as to block many of us from his Facebook page, which is a direct violation of the Swanson decision from the Supreme Court earlier this year, and he has admitted to such recently on public record. You see, he's the wrong man for the job. He's proven it to us time and time again. So I formally request an apology for the law enforcement community of Sedgwick County, for the officer that was involved, for the taxpayers of the city of Wichita, and in conclusion, Brandon Whipple, it is time for you to resign. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Bill, we always appreciate your opinions and we enjoy your stories. Thank you for being here. Madam Clerk. Consent agenda items one through nine. Does every member had a chance to review the consent agenda, and if so, is there any discussion? 
If there is no discussion, then I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion has been made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts dated October 24th, 2022. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Josh Lauber, Department of Finance. The Board of Bids for October 31st, 2022 are as follows. For purchasing, we have 58,000 GVWR cab and chassis dump trucks for Rush Truck Centers of Kansas for an aggregate bid total of $151,319. We have 9,000 GVW regular cab trucks for Rusty Eck Ford for a base bid of $40,987 with all options considered. We have 19,000 GVW four-wheel drive exterior cab and chassis with service bed deferred to November 7th. We have aluminum refrigerant piping replacement rebid for Dean E. Norris Incorporated for an aggregate bid total of $130,084. This is how to become a vendor with the city of Wichita. These are our current open requests for proposals out on the street. And I would recommend to approve the bid wards as recommended. Are there any questions for staff on this item? Is there any input from the public on this item? See none. Back to discussion. Further discussion on this item. If there is no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to receive and file the report, approve the contracts, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have I received seven yay votes? That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Petitions for public improvements. Morning. Good, good morning, Mayor, City Council members, Paul Gunzelman with Public Works Engineering. Um, before you this morning, we have petitions for public improvements. Um, the signatures on all the petitions represent 100% of the improvement district, and petitions are valid per Kansas statute. Casabella, second edition, phase eight, near north of Pawnee and west of 127th Street, which is in District 2. The project will provide water, sewer, paving for new residential development. And it is recommended to approve the new petitions and budgets, adopt the new resolutions, and authorize the necessary signature. Stand for any questions. Questions for staff. See none. Input from the public on this item? See none for the discussion on this item. If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the new petitions and budgets, adopt the new resolutions, and authorize the necessary signatures. Second. Is there a second? Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Have I received seven yay votes? That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. 2023 Special Liquor Tax Allocation. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Mayor and City Council. I am Samantha Hibbard, the Administrator for the City of Wichita Special Liquor Tax Funds. I'm here today to present to you the Liquor Tax Funding Recommendations for 2023. These recommendations were developed by a review committee made of the City of Wichita Special Liquor Tax Coalition members, Sedgwick County Comcare and Corrections members, and one City of Wichita community member. First, I'd like to begin by providing you with a framework in which these recommendations were developed. The taxes collected per Kansas Statute 79-41A04, which mandates that these funds are allocated to programs whose principal purpose is prevention and treatment of substance abuse. The City of Wichita Liquor Tax Coalition, which includes a board membership of professionals with diverse experiences in the treatment prevention community who take this purpose very serious. The goal of this coalition is the reduction of substance abuse and its harmful effects through effective prevention and treatment programs for residents of the city of Wichita. Over the last 25 years, the coalition have maintained a focus on the mission 
by providing quality funding recommendations, monitoring funding programs, and reviewing the development and needs in the substance abuse treatment and prevention fields. All right, so slide two. So this is just a quick timeline of the actions taken, but basically you can see that the coalition worked together to compile a request for proposal, which was released by the city's purchasing department in June of 2022. Okay. There were 18 proposals from 10 agencies received requesting a total of $2,608,748.87 which is almost $850,000 over the amount available for the location. A review committee was organized for the special liquor tax coalition members and included one community member. There were representations from the city of Wichita, Sedgwick County Comcare and corrections on the review committee. The coalition reviewed the, pro reviewed the proposals using evaluation criteria and developed the recommendations you have before you. The committee considered the diversity of proposals submitted, community needs and any gaps in services, the purpose of the special liquor tax funding, how to make the most effective use of these dollars in that context, and the proposing program's use of the evidence-based practices. Making funding recommendations is rarely easy. This is partly because we have so many wonderful agencies in our community that provide quality services every day to help residents lead healthy lives and reach their full potential. The review committee and the coalition faced difficult decisions and had to make some tough choices because of the number of excellent proposals received. This coalition of knowledgeable and experienced professionals used thoughtful, documented procedures and criteria to make recommendations on which programs of the eligible proposals should receive locations to best address the current needs of the citizens in our community. The list of proposed programs the Special Liquor Tax Coalition members are recommending for funding have been presented for you. Thus, it is recommended of the City of Wichita Special Liquor Tax Coalition and that City Council approve the 2023 funding allocations and authorize, authorize the necessary signatures. And that would be it. Can you go back to the list of organizations that this money would go towards? You want me to go through the list? No, I just want you to go back to that slide, please. Oh, yeah. So folks get a better look at it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions for staff? Councilmember Fry. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Well done. Just a quick question. I noticed in the green sheet that the original budget went from 1.4 million to 1.758. Mm -hmm. Where did we find that extra money? I would have to defer you over to the coalition members, Nathan Emery. Nathan Emery, court administrator. Uh, so the way the, the liquor tax works is that there's the, the, the essentially a pool of money. A certain amount is allocated each year uh, and based on the needs of, of um, the different programs and an opportunity to reduce the amount of time that individuals spend in jail, there was a request to disperse more of, of the money. So there's still more money in the special liquor tax fund and we, we maintain a buffer there. Uh, but that's how, how that money got allocated uh, and, and that specific purpose was to reduce the amount of time it takes uh, to get someone screened for services in the jail. So, so why weren't we able to increase it beyond the 1.758 and maybe get additional if there's reserve? And we had to ask of 2.6. And I understand why these were denied, but if there is additional, why weren't we able to get even more? There's additional requested every year. And so we would quickly not be able to meet the needs of the city if, if we did it that way. Likely wouldn't be able to meet the needs. So... Um, the, the money continues to roll over in the fund and, and funds the next year and the next year. Council Member, Ms. Ms. Mayor, I think it's a matter of sustainability. If you were to use all the fund balance, then we would have a deeper hole for next year and not be able to address the uh, treatment issues, which are, I think, the most uh, significant uh, according to the coalition. Good. Thank you. 
I have a question. Um, if someone was dealing with uh, substance abuse and was ready to get treatment, how would they tap into services like this? And also how, I guess, um, how long would it, would the wait be for them to be able to, to get access to services like this? Yes, yeah, so there's a wide variety of access points depending on the need and um, the service needed. So, you know, if you're in the jail, you know, that's an access point. There's access points through ComCare. There's access points uh, for inpatient, outpatient. Um, and so there's not a, a precise answer to that question because it really depends on where the individual is in their, in their addiction or problem, uh, what service they would need and what service they would choose because there are different access points for, for each of those providers. Is there someone who has a more clarifying answer that could possibly tell me, I, I guess, if you, it, it, someone who, who, who has been known in the community recently had to raise $10,000 on a GoFundMe page to go to Texas uh, in order to get treatment because when this person said, I'm ready for treatment. That's the best time to give them treatment. And my understanding is there was no local option that could have got this person in sooner. So I'm trying to get a better idea. I understand if you are to the point where you are in jail or caught up in our uh, um, corrections uh, system, that at that point, uh, getting access might, might be a, a different path than if someone within our community who's struggling, how would they get access to these treatments uh, if they aren't yet, uh, I guess, incarcerated? Sure, I can try. Uh, Courtney Carpenter, Chief Probation Officer. Um, there's lots of, like Nathan said, lots of different avenues. Some depends on insurance, no insurance. Um, and these are just a few of people that actually um, submitted a proposal. Um, our list, even just for the probation office alone, is three pages long of treatment providers. Actually, access is fairly quickly, we can get them in to get an evaluation. And like I said, it depends, insurance, no insurance, you know, on the, the route to go. There's um, some uh, block grant funding through ComCare that they could go through and get them in fairly quickly. Um, and then treatment providers right now are struggling on finding drug certified drug and alcohol counselors. So they're short staffed in um, finding places that can get them in. So it's not the funding or the, it's the people to get them to get an evaluation completed, a, a, a qualified person to get an evaluation done. If any of our substance abuse treatments that we've talked to, that's their biggest struggle is just finding qualified substance abuse counselors. There's just not very many out there anymore. That's a bachelor level credential, is it that is. correct? Yes, now it is. The BSRB the, um, just changed it, oh, probably seven years ago or so. I mean, it could be off a little bit, but on the um, criteria that you have to be, you have to be a, a bachelor level at this point. Okay. Does that answer? Kind of. It just doesn't correlate with the experiences I've been hearing from the public that there's at least six to nine months waiting list to get someone without insurance, addiction, uh, help, and we see a rise in deaths with fentanyl. We see really just the um, onslaught of what what addiction has, has done uh, and continues to do. So I, I just want to, I guess, more clarification for those who are watching, and perhaps if uh, you know if if, if this uh, becomes more widely known, what what is the best uh, way for a mom who's helping a child go through you know, or a young person go through addiction to get them the services they need? I, I, I guess it's reasonable to believe that you won't have. Uh, worker-based health insurance if your uh, addiction is to the point where um, you, you would need, you know, you, you probably have not not been a, as highly functioning uh, doing a 40-hour a work job. So I'm, I'm just wanting to get more details on that for the folks who might be watching and wondering, well, where is this money going and how do we access these services? Mayor, Mayor yes. we're, we're not actively involved in the service provision, so let me get some information that we can share with the council regarding intake points. Okay, yeah, I love that. I mean, I know we're not actively involved. We work with our partners. We are actively involved, giving a 1.7 million. Right. 
Um, and I just want to make sure that, that money is those services are accessible uh, to folks who to as many folks as possible. So uh, I guess we can get that information in the future. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Further questions for staff? Input from the public on this item. If there's no input from the public, we will bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. Nothing. All right. Uh, if there's no discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the Special Liquor Tax Coalition 2023 funding recommendations authorize the 2023 budget of 1.758982 million, let me try that again, $1,758,982 authorize provider contracts uh, be developed for the recommendation allocations and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Pickleball at Edgemore Park. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Troy Hopman, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, the morning. item I have for you today is in regards to uh, pickleball at Edgemore Park, actually adding, um, not adding, but actually converting some tennis courts into pickleball courts. So a little bit of a background. Edgemore Park currently has six tennis courts and six pickleball courts. Of those six tennis courts, um, four of them are lit and two of them are not. Um, the Edgemore pickleball courts were previously converted from two tennis courts uh, several years back. A community group advocated for a $25,000 grant from the Latner Foundation for this expense. It did not come from the city. It came from uh, the pickleball community. Uh, these courts became the very first public outdoor pickleball courts in Wichita. Pickleball has grown significantly in the recent years. Um, if you haven't noticed, there's pickleball everywhere right now. Uh, Riverside Tennis Center, the pickleball revenue has increased 140% from 2020 to 2021, and already this year, for six months, has increased another 30%. Um, there's a lot of increase in participation in leagues, tournaments, drills, uh, and court rentals, so we only see a lot more participation with pickleball. Uh, the group Light Up Edgemore has been advocating for more pickleball courts due to the demand. Currently, there are six pickleball courts and two tennis courts that are at Edgemore that are unlit. Um, the other four tennis courts are under the lights. The pickleball community is concerned about not being able to play in the evenings, often necessarily due to the wait time and during the heat of the summer. So playing underneath the lights just extends the playability and time that people can play pickleball. Uh, adding lights to the existing courts will more than double, actually will more than triple the cost of the court conversion, so of the court conversion. So it means that uh, if we were to put lights in place, it would cost us three times more than what we are uh, anticipating for the conversion of the courts. So recommended action is to convert two of the tennis courts under the lights to six more pickleball courts. That way we would have both tennis courts and pickleball courts that will have lights and unlit courts as well. Uh, Twelve... Pickleball courts will be located at this location, so we'll be able to do more tournaments and leagues. Um, the Parks and Recreation Department is committed to finding opportunities to support both tennis and pickleball. Next year, we're looking at resurfacing the McAdams tennis courts. There's six tennis courts over there, and we're looking at resurfacing those tennis courts and adding a shelter so we can have more opportunities for tennis over at, um, over at that park, at McAdams. To continue with the analysis, the Light Up Edgemore has, uh, group has raised $27,000 towards converting the two tennis courts to six pickleball courts. The Wichita uh, Parks Foundation has committed to matching those funds, uh, so for a projected total of $54,000. The Light Up Edgemore, um, the proposal, actually they have a proposal for Mid-America Court Works to complete the improvements for $52,000. Uh, the Light Up Edgemore is responsible for contracting Mid-America Courts. 
Uh, the Wichita Park, Wichita Park Foundation will administer the funds. The Parks and Recreation Department will approve the final design prior to construction, which we have already reviewed and approved. Um, this item went to the Park Board, the Board of Park Commissioners, and they voted on this project in a positive fashion in August, 20, August 22nd of 2022. The light up Edgemore and Wichita Park Foundation will pay for the improvements to be made for the Edgemore Park and will donate uh, the completed improvements. The law department has reviewed and approved the agreement as to form the recommendation. It is recommended that the city council accept the donation from the light up Edgemore and the Wichita Park Foundation, which includes the design, construction, and converting two tennis courts to six pickleball courts that will be underneath the lights at Edgemore Park and authorizes any necessary signatures. I'm available for any questions. Questions for staff. We're all got Three folks on the um, board at the moment. We'll start with Councilmember Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Troy, how, can we get a number as to how much it would cost to light up all the courts at Edgemore? I know you said double, but... Probably more closer to triple, so it would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and forty dollars to $150,000. Um, as we looked at in the past, there would be a lot more light infrastructure that we would need to work with um, several different companies to get the infrastructure in place just to get the power to that location and additional to the lights as well. Okay, and then uh, you talk about court rentals. Those courts are able to be rented right now? Um, yes, they are. We, we rent courts um, on a larger scale. So if a group wants to rent two or three courts for a tournament or for, um, for drills uh, that are outside of our city programs, we, we do rentals as well. Uh, how often are the tennis courts rented? Is it about yeah. average or? The tennis courts or the pickleball courts? The tennis courts. The tennis courts at that location are rarely um, uh, rented with the exception of one of the schools, local schools that uses it in the afternoons. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up to that question. Did you say to put in double the amount of lighting or it cost three times the amount of of the current proposal? Yes. And that's for infrastructure? So the improvement on the light infrastructure wouldn't, wouldn't I guess, make plugging in other lights any easier. Each one would have to be, because just normally when we do this type of stuff, if you do one and then you add more to it, uh, it's usually cost effective, but this would be one case where. So the lights that are currently at that location have been there for many, many years. So to add more power uh, to light all those lights would require, require um, uh, a larger transformer, um, more digging would have to actually make, make the infrastructure a little bit stronger and beefier to add in all that electricity, plus uh, the actual lights itself. We don't use LED lights or we do. modern lights that use less electricity than the ones that were made years ago? Well, what, what you're mentioning is some of the overhead costs. So yes, if we used LED lights, uh, the day-to-day -day cost would be less expensive, but this is just for the infrastructure to put the lights in place. So if we did put lights in, it's an additional overhead cost as well. Okay. Councilmember Bluebaugh. Mayor, can you walk us through how we do the allocations for the, uh, for the Parks Foundation? So there's several different ways that this happens. Uh, there's a user group or an interest group that will lobby the Wichita Parks Foundation for improvements or for dollars. Um, we have done so ourselves as, as, a, as a department. Um, so a good example is over at Swanson Park. Uh, we needed some additional dollars to finish that project. So we asked the Wichita Foundation for additional dollars. Their board uh, will make that recommendation and will vote on it as well. And so it's actually the board that makes that final decision and recommends where those dollars go. Yeah, how much money is in the Parks Foundation or what, what, what the criteria is for getting funding for that? So there's several different criteria, but I'll talk about the funding first. Since the um, Place for Parks program, uh, it's estimated that we have somewhere about $400,000. Uh, we've used some of those dollars for Chester I. Lewis and, like I mentioned, Swanson Park. Those were some really big dollar items. Uh, I think Chester I. Lewis was $100,000 donated to that site, and I think it was 
$60,000 for the Swanson Park Bridge. Um, the criteria uh, is their criteria. They're the ones that come up with that criteria is regarding to has to be a park uh, project, has to be um, uh, supported and funded through the city, uh, whether there's some CIP dollars or something else that can leverage those dollars, and they're looking for some active participation. So those are some of the basic criteria that they look at. Uh, we present some of our needs, uh, and again, some other community folks also present their needs as well um, to, to that board. Seems like it's, it's kind of being used to fill some gaps or maybe with inflation going on right now to kind of cover some, some things yeah. that we don't have planned for. Be yeah, we've been very lucky when we didn't have enough money for Chester I. Lewis and we didn't have enough money for Swanson Park. Um, if you recall, Swanson Park, we had a private donor that donated 60000 and the Wichita Parks Foundation matched that. In regards to Chester I. Lewis, uh, we had our CIP budget. We had donations from the community. Um, uh, the downtown, uh, Wichita downtown, gave us some, some funding, um, and we were able to match that along with the uh, um, Arts Council as well. So there were several different fundings that we used to get Chester I. Lewis going. But without that $100,000 from the Wichita Parks Foundation, it would have been a lot less. Thanks for better. Sure. Councilmember Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Troy, I just have a couple questions. Did, have we actually gotten a bid for extra lighting, or are you just kind of guessing on how much you think it might cost? I did get a bid several years ago. Mm -hmm. It was roughly about $130,000. Um, so that was several years ago, and I would expect that to, to go up at least 15 20%. Okay. And also, you mentioned in your presentation that pickleball is everywhere right now. Um, I'm just struggling taking the courts away from the kids that are using the courts. So have there been conversations with the school, or yes. what are the plans for um, the kids that were utilizing these courts? Yeah, we mentioned uh, opportunities for that school to use Riverside, or they can go to uh, McAdams. And so, like I mentioned, uh, we're going to be re um, repaving or resurfacing the McAdams courts and um, those will be the best courts in the city once we're done with those because we're going to add the shade structure there as well. Um, they were a little bit uh, frustrated because of the distance that they have to, have to travel, um, but there are other opportunities for tennis courts. We can work with the school district because each one of the high schools have tennis courts. Um, so we're very much aware of the situation of, as we convert some of these pickleball courts um, that we might be losing some tennis courts. We want to make sure that we have a good balance with that. Um, so one reason we're looking at the, the pickle complex down at South Lakes is looking really uh, fantastic because we're going to be adding more uh, pickleball courts without taking away tennis courts. So one of the things that we do is we promote pickleball, we promote tennis, uh, we're finding other ways to look at bringing tennis back to where it once was, and we want to continue to improve uh, all kinds of recreational activities. So for us, it's a, it's a balance that we're looking at this, but the demand for pickleball is is a tidal wave. It's, it's overwhelming right now. I appreciate that. As a tennis player, I just want to make sure that um, we're not saturating um, the city and pushing out some of our tennis players, especially the youth. So um, thank you for the clarification. We agree, and, and that's part of the whole strategy, being very strategic on that. Um, we're, we're trying not to get too far ahead of ourselves by converting tennis courts into pickleball courts. We want to continue evaluating that as we move forward. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, I had a question and a comment, um, building upon Councilmember Bluebaugh's uh, questions. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Wichita Park Foundation for uh, contributing to this effort. Uh, when the Plates for Parks program was envisioned four years ago, the desire was to help close some of these gaps on some of the infrastructure and um, facilities that the park budget wasn't able to cover. And I think they've done a tremendous job with that. My question is, could we get a report on all of the things that the Plates for Parks has funded through the years since its inception? Because um, I think that would be helpful. You mentioned a couple of big ones, but I think there's a couple of smaller ones as well. Yes. Um, I think that would be helpful for the council to see that in action. And a little plug, um, four years we've been doing plates for parks. We're up in the H's now. So 
um, don't forget to, uh, when you renew your tags, get one of those Wichita flag plates because there's about, what, 7,000 of them out there across the state right now. And it's great for community pride to see that, but it also has a very real uh, effect on our park infrastructure support. So, Yes, we're looking at about $20,000 a month on average of dollars going into that fund. Um, I'll work with the folks from the Wichita Parks Foundation. They are looking at hiring a, a marketing firm to um, really kind of showcase all the things that we've done on a, on a bigger scale. Uh, but we can put together a quick report that I could send out to all the council members in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Other questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there is no further discussion, then I'll make a motion to accept staff's recommended action to, oh, excuse me, I retract that motion and I recognize Council Member Johnson as this does reside in District 1. Thanks, Mayor. I will move that the Council accept the donation from Light Up Edgemore and Wichita Parks Foundation, which includes the design and construction of converting two tennis courts to six pickleball courts at Edgemore Park and authorize the necessary signature. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open the roll. Members cast their vote. Having received six yay votes to one nay vote, that motion does pass. Madam Clerk. O.J. Watson Park Improvements. Mayor Council, Troy Houtman, Director of Parks and Recreation. The next item is in regards to O.J. Watson Improvements. A little bit of background. Uh, the watch, watch, uh, the watch, I'm sorry, let me get a drink of water. Watson Park is the only fully staffed destination park within our park system. Uh, there's a variety of activities here at this park. Uh, we got train rides, pony rides, uh, miniature golf, uh, pedal boats. Uh, there's a lot of fishing, uh, shelter that we rent out for birthday parties. We have a very large and very active volleyball league. Um, and we use this site for a lot of different events. Uh, currently right now for a very large haunted island item that's just really doing well. So we had a master plan uh, from 2015 that guides the operations of the capital investments uh, for this area for this park for the next 20 to 30 years. An analysis. Uh, the funding will be used uh, for furniture, fixtures, and equipment at the new season's venue. Uh, landscaping improvements around the park, which includes irrigation systems, uh, making re repairs to roads and sidewalks and other safety concerns that we have in the park that we want to address. Um, financial and legal considerations. It was adopted in the 2023-2032 uh, capital improvement program. Uh, the item, the line item contains $550,100 for 2023 for Watson improvements. Staff recommends initiating the full amount. Funding source is general obligation bonds. Uh, the law department has reviewed and approved the bonding resolution as, for, as to form. Recommended actions is recommended that city council adopt the resolution and authorize the initiation of the project. I'm available for questions. Questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? See none, let's bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there's no further discussion, then Chair recognizes Councilmember Hoheisel as this item falls into District 3. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just want to say before the vote how much I love Watson Park, how much I love um, everything we have going on in the third districts with our parks. Um, so this is, this is a special privilege right here for me to be able to, to make this motion, and I recommend that the City Council Adopt the resolution and authorize the initiation of the project. Second. Which has been made and seconded. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Design concept supplemental design agreement number one for funding for the multimodal facility. Good morning, again, Paul Gunselman, Public Works Engineering. 
The item before you is 30% concept approval, supplemental design agreement, and revised funding for the multimodal facility. On December 15th, 2020, the City Council approved funding for design, infrastructure, and utility work, construction of the facility, and project management. On May 11th, 2021, the City Council approved a design contract with Trans Systems Corporation to, to develop 30% plans for the facility. The 30% plan development includes site survey and site programming to show space for 12 bus bays, ticketing windows, security office, public and staff restrooms, lobby, offices for transit operations and staff, space for bicycle and scooter parking, and parking structure for approximately 400 vehicles. As you recall, the site is located west of Riverfront Stadium on the block bounded by Oak, Texas, Sycamore, and Burton. Trans Systems has completed the 30% plan development. 30% plans have been presented to District 4 and District 6 advisory boards, Design Council, Wichita Transit Advisory Board, Wichita Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, Delano United, and Delano Business Association. 30% concept plans have also been reviewed by and discussed with the staff from Federal Transit Authority. Supplemental design agreement number one will provide final design and specifications and assistance with the bid process. This is a view um, of the northeast corner of the facility. Um, standing on the northeast corner of Texas and Sycamore looking to the southwest. Um, we would uh, propose improvements to the Texas um, intersection to include um, striped crosswalks as this is uh, adjacent to the Delano entrance to Riverfront Stadium. The uh, stair tower there, the, the glass on the stair tower on the north side of it is a, has been identified as an opportunity for aesthetic improvements. The street layout, uh, street level layout of the facility, um, the uh, office space is in blue, which would be adjacent to Sycamore Street. Um, the yellow shows 12 bus loading areas, 12 bus bays. And then on the uh, west end over there, there's a light blue area that um, would be an opportunity for storage space for some light, ma light maintenance activities, such as uh, replacing some bulbs or something in a bus if needed. Looking at a closer look at the office space um, street level, the north side of that, uh, north end of that, um, we have in blue the lobby area. Yellow shows a security office that has um, site views to the lobby as well as to the bus platform. In the gray, we have ticketing windows for Wichita Transit as well as, as space for um, workers, office staff. Um, the purple has a inner city bus ticketing window, window with office. And then the, uh, we have restrooms, public restrooms that access the platform, as well as break area and restrooms for staff. To the south of that, we have a, a pedestrian walkway that I'll show in a few slides, get into more detail on that. South of the walkway, there is more office staff or offices for operation staff or transit. Um, we have a server room there at the northwest corner of that portion for IT purposes. And then we also have in the uh, purple area again, we have uh, space for the bus drivers as well as uh, restrooms for them as well. The peach colored area shows spaces for uh, bicycle and scooter. Uh, rental parking areas. Looking at the east elevation, starting at the right of the screen is a stair tower that I had mentioned earlier that will also have two um, elevators that go into the lobby or access the lobby. Um, we have the lobby there, um, right there adjacent to the stair tower, the office space um, north 
pedestrian walkway, office space south. And then above that, we have the parking structure um, with uh, metal panels for screening as well. The materials used to construct the facility will complement uh, materials used on existing buildings in Delano. This is a closer view of the lobby space. Um, again, it has been identified as some aesthetic um, opportunities. Um, you can see in there, there's a structure hanging from the ceiling that could be an art component as well, or lighting component. And then also the uh, south wall of the lobby was also identified as aesthetic uh, treatments could be placed. This is another uh, concept view of the east side of the facility. Again, the metal panels um, were identified. Um, we could be, you know, they could be perforated to have um, displays in those for aesthetic improvements. And the pedestrian walkway, shown a little bit there. A closer view of the pedestrian walkway. It's approximately 18 feet wide. At the east end, it narrows a little bit towards the west end due to a column for the uh, parking structure itself. Um, but there is also aesthetic improvements available there, as well as will be well lit, and there could be some lighting elements there as well. This is a depiction of the south side of the facility where the buses would enter into the platform off of Burton Street. And then also towards the east end of that is the ramp um, that would access the parking levels up above for vehicles. The parking structure will accommodate approximately 400 vehicles within it. This is a picture of the north side of the facility. We wrapped the uh, metal panels around a little bit on that corner um, to improve the aesthetics as you look south from Douglas area. Um, the buses would enter onto Texas as they leave the site. This is a view of the west side of the facility as if you were standing in one of the yards of the residences on the west side of Oak Street. Um, it shows the ramp, vehicular ramp going up. Um, during some of the meetings that we had with uh, um, various folks, there was concern about the lighting spillover to the residents, but those lights will be directly shining over the parking area to the east. This is a view um, looking east as you're sitting on the, or standing on the platform. Again, at the left edge of the screen is the lobby area. We have the ticketing windows or security office, I'm sorry, security office directly south of that. Ticketing windows for Wichita Transit. We have an inner city bus ticketing window. We have kiosks for um, tickets as well. And then behind the bus would be the um, entrance to the public restrooms with the pedestrian walkway to the south. There is also aesthetic improvements um, not shown here. Well, you can see a little bit of the signage. Um, indicating where you are or the bus bay. Um, we would um, integrate aesthetics into the signage as well, such as, you know, signage above the ticket windows and the restrooms. So there are other opportunities there as well. This is uh, at the west side of the platform um, under the ramp that goes up to, with the, to the parking areas. Um, we did include bike accommodations. Um, we have um, racks as well as lockers for long-term parking of bicycles, storage. On May 11th, 2021, the City Council approved a concept design fee in the amount of $705,000. The proposed cost for supplemental design agreement number one is $1.5 million for a total design fee of $2.2 million. Funding is available within the $19.2 million project budget approved by the City Council on December 15th, 2020. 
the 2022 through 2031 adopted capital improvement program and included $350,000 to integrate art and aesthetics into the multimodal facility. With the approval of the 30% design concept by Design Council, staff recommends initiating the $350,000 at this time. Total revised budget will be $19,582,816. We have an artist consultant with this project. Um, we will go back to Design Council once we have those uh, concepts further developed to get final approval of that. And then we will return back to City Council for final approval of the aesthetics as well. Regarding the <clears throat> schedule, we are anticipating 60% plans to be received in January with final plans completed in April. With that, I recommend approval of the 30% design concept, revised budget, and supplemental design agreement number one, adopt the amending resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. And I will stand for questions. Questions for staff. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, first, great presentation. Appreciate your hard work on this. Um, as I was looking through both your presentation and what we were provided uh, at the restrooms, I didn't see any sex or family restrooms is that something that we can make sure is available for the public I know it will add more like it did with the water treatment plant but yes yes we have had discussion on that so yes we'll know to that yes okay and then can we make sure in uh, all of those restrooms they're changing tables both men's women's and sex and so yes yes thank you councilmember Hoheisel thank you mayor um, now We've had to scale back on this design a little bit because of costs and inflation and workforce and whatnot. Um, I just want to make sure that we are uh, designing this and that way we can add the future improvements that we were planning originally. So that's all worked into the plans where we can come back later and add um, solar panels and whatnot. We are still looking at solar panels on the uh, upper level of the parking garage. Those are still within you know, our, what we were looking at for budget. Um, you, you are correct, when we got the 30% plans, um, we did scale back the project. We had removed a level of the parking garage, reducing it from a little over 500 vehicles to 400. Um, so yes, but we are still looking at the um, electric charging stations for electric vehicles, or the charging stations for electric vehicles, vehicles and that does include the solar. Yep. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Uh, Paul, thank you for the presentation. Can you go back a few slides to the one with the uh, pedestrian tunnel? I can't remember the slide number. I apologize. Close up. That one. Oh, no, one more. Yep. Um, there. So anyone that was around when we had the car drive through City Hall, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I appreciate the addition of this planter. I worry that it maybe it's not... And I know we're at 30 percent, but I think we need to keep that in mind as another opportunity for someone to do that same <laughs> drive through again um, as we design that to make sure that it's safe and that we don't have that opportunity. And then um, on the, the uh, I think there even a couple more back, there was one showing the buses exiting onto Texas Street um, from the Keep going. Well, yeah, that one works. So on this, I see two lanes, and is that a bike lane or is that a parking lane on the uh, next to the green? Oh, my guess is that's parking. We have not. I think that's just schematic, so we have not okay. looked at that. I just want to make sure that we're allowing enough radius for those buses to make that turn coming out if there is going to be parking on Texas. Yes, we have discussed that as well. Okay. Um, and we might have to, you know, with the approaches on the south side, I don't think we can allow any parking along there, but the north side, we have talked about that. To okay. Allow that All right. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions for staff? See none. Input from the public on this item? See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there's no further discussion, the chair recognizes Councilmember Bluebaugh as this resides in District 4. Thank you, Mayor. 
like to take a staff's recommendation to approve the 30% design concept, revised budget, and supplemental design agreement number one and adopt the amending resolution and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded. Clerk open the roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Revision of the City Council District Boundary Lines. Morning. Good morning. Scott Wadel from the Planning Department. So the recommended action on this item is to approve the proposed City Council District Boundaries, place the ordinance on the first reading, and authorize all necessary signatures. Now, uh, as was discussed during the workshop, you have two recommendations from the DAB and the Commission of Electors. Again, this goes back to Charter Ordinance 173, that every 10 years should be revisited after 1992, that the council should appoint a commission, which was done, that there should not be deviation greater than 5% between the districts, and that it should be completed or shall be completed prior to December 31st. In terms of the uh, census information, we use the 2020 census information, and uh, as you can see on this graphic, where it comes to the percentage uh, District 2 is slightly above 5%, and District 3 is slightly below 5%. In terms of the process, there are a number of dates uh, and actions listed on the schedule, but the one that I would highlight would simply be the December 31st date, which the Charter Ordinance says the City Council shall uh, adopt uh, the changes by then. A few things to consider that we asked um, uh, folks to consider through the process is that uh, election precincts, again, are what we used for the geography to maintain a reasonably compact area for the districts, to maintain as much integrity between broadly cohesive areas of interest, avoid using partisan information. Number five is that the districts, again, must be within the 5% deviation. And uh, number six is to consider where growth is going in the next 10 years. Here's a map of the precincts that were used. Here's a map of neighborhood associations. We also had a map of HOAs as well. This is a map of the growth areas identified in the comprehensive plan. In terms of the process, the commission of electors was appointed. And um, here's a listing of the individuals who served. The process, they uh, developed concepts that were refined and a recommendation, two recommendations were ultimately made by the commission of electors and all throughout the process public input was accepted. Uh, information about the redistricting process was posted online. We also had a dashboard where folks could zoom in on maps and look at a variety of information as well. Public input was accepted in person at the meetings, as well as a open house that was held over at the Art Museum. Folks could post sticky comments with uh, thoughts on the variety of different maps uh, and scenarios that were developed. In addition, uh, information about redistricting was posted on forum for a community conversation there, and also on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Nextdoor. In addition, uh, the concepts were presented to the district advisory boards, and the public, uh, public, members of the public had opportunities to comment on them there. In terms of the recommendations, again, there are two recommendations. We've labeled them just simply uh, scenario A, Scenario B, you'll see them referenced in your staff report on this item. I'll go through uh, what some of the similarities are and what some of the differences are. And uh, when we look at these maps, the top number, uh, of course, is the precinct number, and then the red number is the population within the precinct. So A, um, this is a quick listing of changes to the election districts, neighborhood associations, homeowner associations. This is B. Um, again, the listing, we can go back if there are questions about these, but I'll move through them pretty quick. In terms of the maps, they both uh, recommend, or scenarios, they both recommend that Precinct 538 would move from District 5 into District 4. They both recommend that Precincts 213 and 212 would move from District 2 into District 1. They both recommend that Precinct 101 would move from District 1 into District 3. Now they are different uh, with Precinct 262. 
Precinct 262 is up against I-135, and uh, A would recommend that it would move from District 6 into District 1. B recommends that it would remain in District 6. Map A recommends that Precinct 216 would move from District 2 into District 1. Scenario B would not, would not have a change in where it's currently located. In terms of the DAB recommendations, so those were the recommendations from the Commission of Electors. These, again, were taken out to the District Advisory Boards, and uh, you can see that they were split, um, half voting for Map A and half voting for Map B. So the recommended action, again, is to approve the proposed City Council District boundaries, place the ordinance on the first reading, authorize all the necessary signatures. With that, I will stand for questions. So, I guess um, in it seems like some of the contention uh, or some of the arguments between two is based on just real kind of small tweaks. What, with precinct, I think it's 626. How many folks are actually in that precinct? I'll go back to the map, sir. Um, there are 36. Was there any discussion why that was moved? I mean, that 36 people doesn't really, I guess, present a very big deviation between the percentages. But now those 36 people will have to wait an additional amount of time to vote for their, their elected leadership. They're, I mean, they, they now will, will not. It would be a disturbance as far as moving folks from one precinct into a different district when it comes to representation. So I guess what was the discussion I, I, around <clears throat> I can offer up a couple of the trade-offs. Um, one of the trade-offs that was discussed in terms of moving it is that you would have a geographic boundary of I-135, uh, which would uh, help further distinguish the two districts. Um, and that's if it is moved. On the other side um, was the, the concept that if you left it and uh, it was still was to remain in District 6, that uh, they would, the individuals would not have to deal with the confusion of having changed council districts and that there would be more continuity. So the, I guess the main argument to move it was where the street's located? I think that was part of it. The other thing, too, is uh, the continuity of the districts relative to I-135 and also, I think, just the small adjustment in population. But again, it's 36 individuals, so it's not very large. Okay. For sure, we'll have more discussion about that. Thank you. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. We'll open up to public comment on this item. And for public comment, please state your name and your address if you are comfortable. And also, please be mindful of the five minutes. If you go over your five minutes, uh, I will let you complete your thought. But we ask folks to be respectful of time. Welcome. I'm Javen Gonzalez. I live in District 6, and I was a member of the Commission of Electors uh, appointed by Maggie Ballard. Uh, I, to answer your question, I wanted to give some insight to the council on what some of those uh, changes were. Um, it would be my recommendation that Map B would be the one that you would pass. Um, I think that's the, the better of the two maps. Uh, map B was actually one of the original maps that was proposed by the commissioners, actually um, appointed by Brian Fry. Uh, Lamont Anderson was who uh, drew that first map. We used that map to draw several different variations. Um, e I think each commissioner at the end drew one variation from that original map, um, which shows that that map was a great map to begin with. It did need a few tweaks um, just to get the populations you know, more appropriate. Um, let's see, uh, map B uh, keeps that population number within the acceptable range with moving the least amount of people, which is important because when you move residents unnecessarily, uh, it creates issues with uh, voter turnout, knowing which polling location they're going to, knowing what you know, district they reside in, knowing what years their elections are. Um, so my biggest concern with map A is moving precinct 216 uh, from district two into district one. Uh, that's nearly 2,000 people, so it's a lot bigger variation than that small uh, precinct with 36 people, which is still important, but the 2,000 people is more of a concern to me. 
um, that would also cause that those individuals in 216 to not have the opportunity to vote for representation for nearly six years uh, because they, the election for uh, District 1 would just happen um, and the election for District 2 would be happening next year. Uh, it's also important to note that the only neighborhood association that came and spoke to us at the meetings was the Eastridge Association. Uh, they sent two representatives to the meetings. Now, we had several others at the forum, but at their actual meetings, we only had the one. Both of those representatives supported Matt B at the end. Uh, and we also had the most uh, public turnout and uh, po uh, positive comments on that Matt B. Uh, I'd also like to note that um, the district that that mostly affects, which is District 2, their advisory board is one of the advisory boards that voted to approve Matt B. Uh, and that is what district would be affected by that. Uh, if you, anybody had any other questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's just my, uh, my two cents. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Further input from the public? All right, uh, we will bring discussion back to the bench. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, maybe this is a Bob or Jennifer question. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez mentioned there would be a six-year impact on this. I know District 2 is up for election next year, and I believe District 1 is 2025, which I count two years. Am I missing something? I'm going to ask Sharon Dickgraff, who's advised on the redistricting, to, to comment. She'll probably have a, a full background on this. I don't think there would be six years. I mean, the, the, the max would be four, um, given their most recent elections and then the upcoming elections. So I don't think that there would be six years between representation for this particular district. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Buba. Thank you. I guess I have a um, question for the two council members. Um, are, are in one and six and trying to better understand I realize the canal routes right there but I, th I thought my knowledge of that neighborhood is still the traffic and stuff still it really isn't interfered with now around am, am I right in assuming that or Cause it seems like everything goes under it doesn't it either one I didn't well I guess I'll jump I just didn't know if I needed to be acknowledged um I don't feel really strongly about it. I know that it was confusing when, when I knocked a few doors over there at one point, and there were some folks on the other side of this house I was at that was in District 6, and they thought the highway was a natural barrier. Um, but it's 36 people. They feel more comfortable staying in District 6. I don't have a big issue with that. I would say that, would, that was the only, um, <clears throat> excuse me, conversation um, in the DAB is just to not confuse people, and it is a small amount of people, so um, just to kind of keep it where it is. Vice Mayor Tuttle. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I first just want to thank the Commission of Electors. I, I know it was a daunting process and had time added to your already busy schedules, time away from your friends and family. Also want to thank staff. Um, Scott and his team did an amazing job. Communications did an amazing job of arranging things and, and making sure that everybody knew the process. Um, as Mr. Gonzalez mentioned, we did have community input at the event, but then also at the, the actual meetings and at district advisory boards. So thanks to the community for caring and getting involved. I did want to address the comment made by Mr. Gonzalez regarding my district advisory board. Um, precinct 216 is one of the areas that's of issue. And I'm cognizant of the fact that people are going to be moved no matter what, no matter which map we adopt. So that's certainly something that I'm aware of. My district advisory board, and I mentioned this during the workshop, but in the spirit of redundancy, I'll just mention it again. My district advisory board made the motion to approve map A, and it was seconded. During the discussion phase is when two members of my district advisory board mentioned that they live in District 216 and they would be directly impacted. And so that was a concern for them. And we had robust discussion and then map, a substitute motion was made for map B to be um, recommended. It was seconded and then approved, as you can see. 
But we did have discussions, and I've had discussions with my district advisory board members, and they are cognizant of the fact that we should do what's best for the community. And so my district advisory board and the two members who would be impacted in District 216, in my opinion, are comfortable with either map being approved, whichever map is best for the city of Wichita. Um, one thing that is of concern of me in, is that in, in map A, there's a greater deviation. Um, if you see the 15,000, 1,592, District 2 is growing so quickly that that already may be um, an issue. And so when I'm looking at the two maps, I, of course, want to listen to my district advisory board, but feel comfortable that they, they were supportive of either map. But one thing that I really am, as I mentioned, aware of and concerned about is the percentage of deviation in growth in District 2. So just some comments, happy to answer any questions that my colleagues may have. Thank you. Councilmember Fry. Thank you, and I appreciate those comments, Vice Mayor, because um, that is an area related to the difference between Map A and Map B that I have uh, pinpointed. Um, having that deviation loss in District 2, I believe you've probably already seen enough growth since the census to make that up. Um, and with map B, having more numbers will put it out of whack. And the fact that district one in map A is growing helps the infill, whereas in map B, you're losing 1,000. And I don't think that's good for district one. We need to make sure that that representation is there. So uh, I appreciate your comment as it relates to that because that was something that I focused in on as well. So I'm supportive of map A and, and when we're ready for a motion, if we're at that point, I'd be yeah, happy to make it. We're not. We're still in discussion. Um, does the vice mayor or the previous speaker have any evidence to back up, I guess, projections that they've stated of population in addition to the numbers that were used by the, uh, the board for creating this? Because I feel like comments like it's probably already off would need to be examined and if I guess there are is evidence that things have changed already should the board relook at this if if did the bar, board have the wrong information is that is that the argument that's being stated so no. could I I guess get a source for sure I can address it please um, I would just use the example of the last two years, the number of development activity for residential rooftops that we've seen in District 2. And I, and I see staff move forward. They can probably validate that. I would like to address it as well. I was going to make the exact same comments. But yes, indeed, I've had discussions with staff since this has happened to have some confirmation. So it's not just an assumption. And did the board, thank you, staff, for being here, and I guess to tell us that so much development has happened, it's thrown off the census. Uh, can you also, I guess, let us know what, um, was this information presented to the board uh, so they can make a proper decision? Yes, and the uh, growth areas that were shown in the uh, maps with the uh, districts and the precincts, uh, we did highlight those. Uh, if you look at the development trends reports that we do each year, uh, both District 2 and District 5 have the highest percentage of uh, homes being built and uh, population following out there. And that's what we saw in the census, and it's been a trend for the last uh, three decades. Over the last two years, is there reason to believe that the census was off to the extent where we're now we should be making a decision based off of analysis for the last two years versus the census that was done uh, before then? I, I think there's been enough growth out there that, yes, uh, we would be seeing the numbers uh, going out of whack fairly quickly. Can you give us a chart or some statistics or anything to show that this will go, quote, out of whack very quickly? Um, do you have a I don't, slide? I don't, I don't have a slide right now, but uh, uh, we can get you that information. Well, I need to vote on this in about five minutes, so yes. can I get... I, 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 I'm just 
concerned about new data getting thrown out off the cuff without citations, without it being seen, particularly since this process took as long as it did with people who gave up their time and talents to go over the current data. And the argument, it seems here, is that current data wasn't accurate, that now the data that isn't being shown, that isn't available at this moment, is accurate. And we're supposed to, I guess, just take projection opinions without anything to, that I can see as concrete to back that up. No, uh, the, the census was very accurate for 2020. Uh, we went through uh, the uh, data very carefully with a uh, recount. We did find some discrepancies in terms of where population was allocated to certain uh, blocks that really shouldn't have been recognized as, a, as population, but they were to adjacent areas uh, our, our count was very accurate as far as the census, but in terms of what we've seen since 2020 in growth for uh, both District 2 and District 5, District 2 is the fastest growing in terms of uh, uh, housing unit uh, permits and uh, units built, and District 5 is uh, following that, and uh, just you know, in the past two years, uh, 21, 22 now, we're getting into 23, uh, it's going to start skewing those numbers so that by uh, 2030, you're going to be quite a bit out of whack. And, and maybe 2025, if, if, if you don't account for that in what you're doing now. Can someone go back to the slide on the uh, ordinance, the charter change that was made uh, in order for us to, to come up with this? Because my understanding is redistricting is based on the census and not based on what's happened since the census. And if there is changes in data or changes in the census, we won't know that until the next census. So I'm, a, I'm concerned that we are utilizing a different standard than what the process is. Now, I know that there's supposed to be some that potential growth is part of it, or can be, but again, this is supposed to be based off the census, not the census plus an analysis of building permits two days or two years later. Is this the best we have as far as the I thought there was more details. Every ten years after Can someone help me find the part where it says that we base this off the census and not other data? Because I thought that was part of the presentation. And I can I can tell you that it is to be based off of the decentennial, and it's every ten years after 1992, and that's because they use the 1990 10-year census data, and so that's by the time that that data would have been available, and so that's what we use every 10 years is that 10-year census data. And a deviation of 5% is roughly to fill in a gap if there's, uh, that that circumvents uh, the the 5% either way is how you, you're still within alliance for change of population growth, I believe is the purpose of deviating by 5%. So the current, by basing it off the census numbers within the current 5% gets you roughly where you need to be when it comes to growth. I, I'm just wondering why are we utilizing data that is not supposed to be considered in accordance with our ordinance? What? Especially if one map actually eliminates two people that this body has already approved to represent that district. I mean, that also is a factor. My understanding is there's never been 
a map that has been passed and approved by the legislature that actually moved elected officials uh, and DAB members are appointed, but normally you, know, you want the least uh, dis uh, disruption. The, the charter ordinance provides in section two that the uh, districts are to be divided um, no greater than or less than a deviation of 5% based on the U.S. decennial census or upon the most current population data then available. I mean, historically, we have used the census data because that has been the most reliable data. Um, there's nothing to say that the council can't redistrict more often um, if there are other sources of data. Um, but the charge in the current charter ordinance is that it is a 5% deviation um, based on the census data or um, most current population data available. Okay, so current population data, is there anything equivalent to the census that's more current than the census when it comes to population data? Uh, because gonna... building permits is a variable that could mean more population unless, unless people are, are just building more houses. Uh, because we have older houses in, in other areas. So That's a is planning question, not a legal question. Okay. Do we have a, and it also says, or, my understanding is this was based on the census, not some other data. It doesn't say and. So. Well, the closest we can come in terms of what has happened since the 2020 census in population is uh, what we would estimate from uh, housing units being built uh, since that time. And we apply an average household size and take in some factor for vacancy. Um, and we're trying to pull up some, some numbers on the latest development trends report that, that could give you some insight to that. But, uh, uh, Basically, as I stated before, District 2 is the fastest growing district. It'll take just a moment to look up the information on the planning department share drive. I'm not sure if the information, what I'm trying to get at is this information material. Is it relevant? What was just stated by legal is a census or another population point that to me seems equivalent to the census if there is an argument of building permits and thus a projection I, I think that's one variable I would also have liked to have seen if we're going to just open it up what are the variables of folks who passed away because of COVID uh, between when the census was conducted to now and how we're different uh, I, I guess different uh, um, zip codes or areas affected by that uh, my understanding is by, I guess, utilizing more of a piecemeal um, analysis, you open a door to more questions, and therefore now we're, we're in a different place than we normally would be if we just base it off the census data, which my understanding is what usually happens. In terms of deaths and what occurs in the districts, I don't know that we're going to have that information available. I'll have to defer to Stephen, but we're still trying to address the first question, which is, uh, do we have any statistics on the amount of development that's taking place in the, in the districts in order to help you provide insights about development trends? And that's what we're looking up right now. I'm more interested in population than, than building permits. I understand the, the connection between... If you build a house, it's likely a family is going to move into that house, but this is based off population, not off housing. And again, this could be completely avoided if we just stick to the ordinance, which the ordinance states we base this decision off the last census or something equivalent to the census but it seems like we're trying to do both.
Do you want to say? Yeah, we don't have a, a population breakout on the the uh, ho housing units here. Just pulling it up. Uh, the 2021 American Community Survey data has not been uh, released at a level. It's only citywide at this point. Uh, we won't have the breakdown to block group or census tract until uh, spring of this year. So the latest data we have is the 2020 uh, data. So your 2020 census actual data. population. Okay, data. so we're back to the 2020 census then. Yeah. Okay, and therefore arguments based off different variables would be outside of the process at this point? Because I just feel like we've just confused well, this to the point where now we're outside the ordinance, we're outside... It, it, it's, a, it's a consideration, and you have the plus or minus 5%, which allows you to uh, have some deviation because some of these precincts are so large, you're not going to match up precisely. Uh, the county has a different process where they were able to get very exact, but they then create the precincts after the county's process. We don't have that option. We have to work with what the election office provides uh, after the county process. So the 5% does give us leeway in using those as building blocks, but within that 5%, uh, we've always taken the view that you can consider where growth is occurring because you really don't want the uh, districts to get out of whack too far ahead of the next census. The idea of the 5% deviation is to try to get as close as possible to one man, one vote representation. It's not based off one person, one vote representation. It's based off population, including a population of folks who can't vote, such as minors. Uh, so that's why the census data is what's usually utilized, because census data takes more than just voter registration data. Now, I just don't know why we're throwing information in at this point in a process that is not, that's outside of what's required with the ordinance. The point of utilizing census data and 5% deviation is that when it does go, I guess, quote, out of whack, we change it in 10 years. Uh, and again, I guess working off building permits is a variable, but it's a far cry, in my opinion, from what the census did. The census is the standard. Uh, and if we were to go into, I mean, I guess we could have gone into school registrations. I guess we could have gone into, again, death certificates, aging of population with zip codes has folks of a certain age versus folks of a different age. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I think an academic mind would go into when it comes to determining future population growth and outcomes, but that's not our position as policymakers. It's to focus utilizing a census or something equivalent. So I, I guess I'm just concerned that this has muddied the water to the point where people will be making votes based off information that frankly shouldn't have been presented. Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you. I'm the one who, I guess, muddied the waters. So just to make a point of clarification, based off the 2020 census data, I feel map A is what's best for the city of Wichita. Looking at nothing else, I still feel that map A is the best for the city of Wichita. Thank you. And that's my problem, is do we use staff to make a political argument about what we feel is best, or are we sticking to what the map actually the maps are both maps fall within a five percent deviation both maps are proper both maps went through the process both maps got presented by the public i believe map a had less input by the public i believe that was actually sent out forward 
after public discussion, but that's like that, that's that's where I'm at with this is I, I'd just like to follow up. I went to every one of the elector uh, the commission of electors meetings except for one due to a family emergency. The information was presented. There was robust discussion. We went through the process. We now have two maps. There's nothing political. It's just a matter of which map we each feel is best for the city of Wichita. So there's no muddying the waters. We have what we have. The process has, everybody's gone through the process. And as I mentioned, and I'll state it again, I feel map A is what is best for the city of Wichita based on the process that we went through and the data that was presented at those meetings. Map A was not the map confirmed by your DAB board and would also result in two members of your DAB board being removed. Is that correct? That's correct. But there also may be other appointees of the city of Wichita council members who get moved through this process. It may not just be my two district advisory board members. Um, Council Member Fry may have in his loss somebody who's his library board appointee, for example. We don't know that. That should not, in my opinion, be taken into consideration. It should be what's best for the city of Wichita. Council Member Fry. Thank you. Um, again, I think We've said this quite a bit, and staff has supported both Map A and Map B meet the qualifications. Anything else is consideration as to where the recommendation from the council, any of the others, data, and so forth, can be helped to shape our decision. So, and we've been over this. With that, I make a motion that we adopt Map A for the redistricting. Second. Councilmember Ballard. Motion and a second on the floor. Right, and Councilmember Ballard's on the she board. Speak she can to speak the to the motion. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to make a motion to um, approve the proposed redistricting recommended map B um, place on ordinance on the first reading and authorize all necessary signatures. Chair recognizes that as a substitute motion. I will second that motion. Can you speak to the motion since? Map B, your district, I guess, came out most concerned with Map A. Can you speak to why Map B, based on your position, uh, is has caused you to make this motion? Yeah, um, Map B passed my dad unanimously, and um, there was great conversations about, even though it was a small percentage or a small amount of people, that that was um, the map that we felt like was best for our district. All right, it's a substitute motion for map B. Uh, is now on the table. Councilmember Hoheisel can speak to the motion or uh, the debate. Second. Thank you, Mayor. Then Matt, substitute motion for map B has been made, seconded, and then an additional second. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Uh, further discussion? Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received four yay votes. That motion does pass. Map B is adopted. Madam Clerk. Zone 2022 44. Zone change requests in the city from TF3 to family residential to be multifamily residential for redevelopment of medical use generally located within two blocks east of North Hillside Avenue and one block north of East Murdoch Avenue, 839 North Vassar. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Scott Wadel from the Planning Department. Uh, this is uh, zone case 2022-44. This is the second time that this item will be considered by the City Council. This is a non-consent item because both the, the MAPC and the DAB recommendation were different the first time, uh, but then subsequently there are protests for this application, and those protests and also having the item deferred from the prior council meeting is why this is being presented. In terms of the request, again, the applicant's requesting to uh, rezone from TF3 to B multifamily. And that is because B multifamily allows for medical facility uses, and the applicant has indicated they're requesting rezone in order to develop a medical facility and parking lot with 41 to 82 beds. In terms of the property, the 
site is the former Wichita Children's Home, which you can see here outlined in orange. The, uh, and this includes the two single family homes that are along Vassar. I'll go back, this red box is the rezoning application area, so it's a subset of the larger development site. In terms of the context, uh, the properties of north, east, and west are zoned TF3, two family residential, and are developed with single family residential dwellings. Here's the zoning. Property to the south is zoned B multifamily and developed with a medical center that shares the same ownership as the applicant. In terms of the staff report, the staff report provides a review of parking screening and landscaping requirements. On September 15th, the MAPC recommended approval 9 to 4. Several members of the public spoke in opposition to the rezoning request uh, in the indica as indicated in the staff report. On October 3rd, District Advisory Board 1 recommended the City Council defer the item until after the DAB 1 meeting in November. And again, there were uh, multiple folks who spoke at that meeting and is indicated in the staff report. At that meeting, the applicant indicated that the rehabilitation center would likely uh, proceed if the zoning was turned down, uh, and that would proceed on the B multifamily zone property uh, that that's along the rest of the site. On October 18th, the city council heard the case and deferred the item to the November 1st meeting. On October 22nd, District Advisory Board 1 had a special meeting and considered this item for a second time. The DAB voted to recommend approval of the requested rezoning 501. Multiple individuals attended the meeting to ask questions and to share their thoughts. The applicant and their associates were also in attendance. During the meeting, much of the discussion focused on two designs that were shown by the applicant. In terms of protest, 15 protest petitions were received for the requested zone change, eight of which were valid. And the Valid protests accounted for 23% of the protest area. So I'll take you through some of the images and graphics on this one. So here's, again, the subject site uh, for the rezoning. This is the larger development site as part of the project. Here's the zoning for the area. You can see the TF3 zoning in yellow. This is from the comp plan. It shows new employment and residential recommended in the area of the application. Uh, site plan submitted by the applicant as part of the application. This is the protest map, again, showing that it's just over 20% at 23%. This is a map that shows the protest area in green and the notification area in yellow-orange color. Here are some photos from the site and surroundings. This is the uh, image or graphic of the uh, former children's home that was along on the site from the north, or from the south, I should say. And these are, it's a pretty grainy photo, but these uh, show the diagrams that were shown by the applicant at the district advisory board meeting. And the large takeaway from this is just the difference in where the building would be located relative to the parking, which was discussed at the DAP meeting. And with that, uh, back to the aerial, and I'll stand for any questions. Questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? This is not an item that's open. This is not an input from the public item. I appreciate legal uh, uh, helping me because I feel like every other week I mess this one up, but uh, I just kind of get in that flow. So thank you, legal, for um, your, your assistance. Uh, let's further discussion or entertain further discussion on this, and I, I'd be interested to hear if he's willing to take the floor, uh, Council Member Johnson of District 1, as I, I think this has been an ongoing discussion with the community. Thanks, Mayor. Scott, the DAB and the MAPC decision basically was the same right after the last one. That's correct, sir. When the DAB considered it the second time, they recommended approval of the rezoning. Okay. Um, with that, just... We've had this discussion and appreciate Wesley coming back to the table. I would move that the council adopt the findings of the MAPC, place the ordinance on first reading, authorize the necessary signatures, and instruct the city clerk to publish the ordinance after approval on the second reading. 
Second. Motion is made and then seconded. Clerk will open roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Uh, Council member Ballard. Thank you. Um, I'd like to appoint the Golf Board of Governors. Uh, Jesse Ramos, Randy Blummel, Marsha Alterman, Robert Alexander, Mike Jordan, Jordan Smith, and Evan Skelton. Other appointments? Council Member Fry. <clears throat> so I'm a little confused by this process. Um, I thought on the Golf Board of Governors that it wasn't one council member's appointment, but it was going to be made by the council as a whole. Can you help me out, Mr. Manager? Yes, I think, I think what you have in front of you now, it's, it's not a single person's. I think Council Member Ballard is trying to get it out for discussion, and then the council is, is, does make that appointment together. All those appointments because I'm not familiar with every candidate on this list and I think it's too important of a decision to just not have the opportunity to get more familiar with each one of these names sure right. you look like you want to add a thought you floor is yours mr. manager well we have provided some background information for each of the candidates um, but more than happy to provide additional information if you need that. Councilmember Ballard, could you, I guess, talk to us a little bit about the list of appointees and, and what, uh, what, what, what the, and this is new, um, so perhaps walking us through a little bit. Uh, we, we have created this board uh, recently as, as we've adapted our, the way that we, we have oversight of our golf courses, so. Uh, sure. Um, and thank you for the question. Um, so four of the um, people that were chosen are a representative for each golf course. One is to represent the turf management and then retail, food and beverage, and then the finance. Um, so I think this is, this is something that we talked about um, when the council approved uh, to hire the new director of, of golf and I think he's eager as well. He's got some some ideas that he wants to bounce off of the new um, governor's board. And so, um, yeah, I, I received the list last week with a little blurb from each um, appointee or nominee, I guess. Um, so I think we're just ready to get this board moving so that they can start meeting and conversing on some of the changes that, um, that Jesse liked to put in place. So and so this board, the representation is actually nominated from the golf, different golf courses to represent those golf courses. Is that accurate? And then this is the approval of that. And Councilmember, I see you doing something with your hand. If you need to get on this board, please press the button and I can recognize you. Mr. Mayor, if I can clarify, the yep. first four nominees are from the men's and women's clubs of each of the courses, and that's according to ordinance. And then you have three other appointments all that are to meet some type of expertise that's outlined in the ordinance. So you have a person who has extensive turf uh, experience that's in front of you. You also have someone who has an extensive accounting background. Both of those meet criteria. Those are names that are, uh, were advanced by, the, by staff in consultation with the uh, uh, superintendent of golf. And then the last one, which is I think the one that is that where there should be more council discussion is for the retail position because I believe that that again came from staff. I believe a council member had suggested that individual, um, but I know that there's at least one other name that has been considered or is out there. And so that's, I think, where the, the discussion should come from the council. If, if you're comfortable with the other two at large, those are ultimately those three positions are all determined by the council, right? Um, so the first four positions are, if we were to reject them, then the, the, uh, it would go back in, to the golf courses. They would send us either the same name or different names. The next three, these, are very, these aren't representatives of, of a district. These are specific folks with specific skill sets, like in other boards where uh, you need someone, folks with specific skill sets. That's similar. And the last one is a retail partner and 
staff has recommended one, but there might be another person that, I guess, if we wanted to uh, dabble in, in who's the best retailer, uh, then council could have discussions on that. So that's right, right. that's basically right. the gist of why this is different than other that's appointments. That's accurately described. And, and actually, there are similarities between this and I, I can think of the diversity, inclusion, civil rights, where you listed certain criteria f to be considered in appointments. I think there's another board that you need folks who, who are engineers or they have also, there's a few boards like this, but very, very similar. Um, further discussion on this motion. I'll second the motion. Further appointments. All right. If not, I'll make a motion to accept accept the uh, the appointments as are. Excuse me. Those have been. I will second that motion. It's already been made. Uh, and clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote on if we are accepting the nominees of the board. Have received 68 votes to one nay vote. That motion does pass. Back on comments. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just for the record and to explain my vote, I feel like today we've allowed misrepresentation, misunderstanding, and misinformation to impact our vote to redistrict the city of Wichita. Um, we already heard that election cycles were wrong from one of the presenters. Uh, there was only a two-year impact on voting for representation. It is true that anyone who moved from District 5 to 4 or from 2 to 1 or 3 was going to lose an election cycle uh, in their um, opportunity to vote. That did happen when we look at DAB members. District 1 was already going to lose two DAB members to District 3. Anyway, many of us might be in that same boat. I made an attempt to make sure that District 1 had representation from the southern part of the district. Now that southern part will be District 3, which was not an issue. The confusion that was added to the discussion today, historically, through the process of redistricting, we've used projections and census data. The projections have thus far been accurate. District 2 grew the most. That was said in the last redistricting. We saw District 2 grow by 7,000 people, and with all the development, that's going on around K-96 and other areas, District 2 is going to continue. Their deviation is positive and not negative, which means we're going to see this yet again. The census data proves that from 2010 to 2020. We have that data. It shows that it's going to continue. District 3 was uh, projected to grow the least, which is why they took in so many people. That is likely to continue unless some of the developments down south really pick up where that might be different but the data shows where we were. Lastly, Map A had unanimous consent from the committee. Silence is consent. One of the members of that committee was silent. And Map B that we approved was approved four to three, like today's council meeting. And I just wanted it in the record that that is my view of what happened today, which I feel is unfortunate. Thank you. Any other explanations or votes? All right, so I do want to thank the board for their participation in this process for redistricting. Glad I won't be around 10 years from now when they do it again. Um, and I hope that, uh, I guess, the confusion today might actually be able to put a or instead of, or an and uh, instead of an or when it comes to census data and alternative data uh, so that we can clean up our ordinance to match, I think, how uh, folks have perceived the process. Uh, if there's no more discussion, then I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion has been seconded. Clerk will open a roll. And with the seven yeas to zero nays, we are adjourned. Thank you all.